Hey guys, Level Cap here, and welcome to uh, devlog number 22 for a spaceship game that I'm making with my buddy Rich and a bunch of help from the community. We are really having some fun with the game right now. We switched it over to Unreal Engine 5.4, upgraded from 5.3 to get some new features, and we also got our first SeaWiz AI in the game, which lets me recreate some of my favorite combat sequences from basically The Expanse and kind of turn our game into a little bit of a bullet storm simulator when in close quarter combat. Let me show you. All right, here we are in game. Let me spawn a pirate ship. Should be a patrol ship. And he's coming in guns blazing already. Trying to hit me. It is predictive aiming, so he will hit. Um, the only way to dodge is to basically continue to accelerate so that the predictive aiming can't track you. I'll probably be adjusting this as we go, but he's already taken out my main engine a bit right there. I'm losing some of that power. Let me return some fire on him. Actually, let's see if I can disable him. He's almost disabled. There we go. Oh. Ooh, God. I gotta get out of range. Okay. We have a little bug where he doesn't stop firing at the moment. Now, get in close. I'll show you another cool thing. Uh, now that ships are disabled, technically they're supposed to stop firing once they, they are disabled, but should be able to come in here and dock with him. So, in-game, this would be how you would loot a ship after combat. And then, this is a placeholder UI. And then once you've got your loot... ...and then get away. Now, if you don't disable a ship and you say, uh, just destroy them outright... ...then some cargo will be spawned based on their inventory. Uh, we just don't have that in the game yet. But, it'll be more rewarding to board a disabled ship versus just blowing up outright. All right, what happens when I spawn in something with a little more, uh, oomph. oh my God, he's got too many sea whiz. So these big ships, oh great, and I'm in range of a missile mine. All I need right now. Okay, I think we got out of the range, but these big ships are gonna be really challenging to close in on. As a small ship, you'll have your maneuverability so you can dictate the fight, but if you make a mistake, you're gonna get absolutely shredded. Now, all the values and damage outputs are temporary at the moment. That's all gonna get changed as we go. But right now, it's just really fun to finally be able to test out and visualize those close-in weapon systems in ship-to-ship -ship combat. Now, to get these new AI systems working, Rich actually used some brand new features available in Unreal Engine 5.4, and he's gonna explain it to you. I've been working on AI for enemy ships lately. Up to this point, we've had some very basic AI, but uh, no real decisions being made. Unreal has some built-in stuff for this. There's behavior trees, state trees. After a little bit of learning both of them, I figure that state trees are the way to go for now. Maybe I'll end up using both, but I'm gonna focus all my energy on state trees at the moment. State trees are a newer feature that came along in Unreal 5. And in 5.4, they added another even cooler feature that makes these state trees modular so we can link multiple small state trees together into one huge one. So one AI could have a big, huge state tree made up of a bunch of little state trees, while another AI could just have a little tiny piece of that bigger state tree. And they're both using the same pieces to put together the bigger state trees. So what is a state tree? Well, it's a tree full of states. Typically in programming, what you do with a tree is you'll start at the root and you'll traverse the branches You'll sometimes get to the leaves, or maybe you'll get to a branch and decide, nope, this branch is not what I want. I'll move to the next branch. And that's what we're doing with this state tree. We've got a root here. That's where everything starts. And then every frame, basically, it traverses all these branches and tries to decide, should I evaluate this branch? Should I evaluate this branch? In this case, we've got some conditions that say whether or not it's okay to fire missiles now. There's a certain range. Um, or maybe I don't have a target. Uh, same with firing CWIS. There's a certain range that this is valid. Otherwise, I can't fire missiles or CWIS, so I'll just sit idle for now. In the future, this tree will be much more complicated, having many more decisions to make, like movement or other tactical decisions. If we drill down into one of these branches, let's look at the firing missiles one. We've got these conditions. If these conditions are not met, this branch is passed over. If these conditions are met, then there's a certain set of tasks that are done. And then there's some transition rules that say like, if this is 
uh, successful, then go to this other branch. Or if this is no longer valid, then go back to the root of the tree and try again to find another branch that is valid. So what are these conditions? Well, basically, uh, we're looking at if the current target is a valid object, meaning do we have a current target or don't we? If we don't, then we'll skip all the way down to idle. Um, then we compare the range that is that we can fire missiles. There's a minimum range and a maximum range. Uh, let's make sure that the distance to the target is within that range. And then we've got some special stuff over here called evaluators that basically are in charge of getting all this data for us. Uh, for instance, target distance squared, current target. That is a special blueprint where when the tree starts, we get our targeting brain. We just set a reference to it. Every tick, we see if there's a valid target. If not, we set the distance to zero. We probably don't have to though, because all the other conditions will prevent those branches from being evaluated because the target's invalid. But if it is valid, then I set the current target and I set the target distance squared. Both of these are in the output category. So they show up here and then they're usable in these conditions. Now, Rich has also helped me get another system working in the game. This right here is sort of a prototype for an asteroid hideout. This might be where settlers, people who are not associated with the bigger colonies or pirates, live, hang out, build their bases. Rich built out a little blueprint controller that uh, controls the blinking of these little uh, instant static meshes that I've propagated around the base here. Um, and he needed to do that because we're triggering two different material brightness factors and the blueprint was the best way to control it and he made it super easy to add in other lights. Now our new asteroid base uses the new blinking light system as well. We're thinking about also doing a light sequence where it flashes from one end to the other, kind of ushering ships into the bay, but uh, Rich wasn't able to get that working quite in time and we switched over to a different process. But actually the way these lights are built is kind of cool. We've got a material here that basically controls the light bulb part of the light. We have the material that just controls the main body. And then we have a material that controls a fake glow effect. It's basically a plane that always faces the camera using essentially a sprite node here in the material world position offset. Our Discord community helped me figure out how to offset the plane so that it's closer to the camera so that it doesn't obstruct the actual light body itself. So it's normally just a plane that's stuck right into the light there. But when we apply the sprite material, it now faces the camera and that's all done on the material side of things, the shader essentially. Now when I add a light to the level, I can literally just drag in this single light. It's already got the bloom attached to it. it I can make instance static meshes of it and then hook it up to a little blueprint light controller that controls the blinking. It's a very clean workflow and I'm glad we got it set up because we're going to have a lot of lights in this game. Now, I've been dancing around some of the more advanced material workflows for a while simply because I've never liked UV unwrapping and doing all this annoying material stuff on the back end, but I just got to get used to it. So I've spent the past week or so uh, getting more familiar with trim sheets, uh, more familiar with decals, and some of the more advanced workflow techniques to sort of speed up certain aspects of workflow and reduce some of the texture overhead for the game so you're not needing quite as many high resolution textures to fill up a scene space. So this here is a tile component for the asteroid base. It'll be sort of a little cutaway section of the wall where you can see the pipes and wires and machinery uh, behind the paneling. And I've made a trim sheet now for my pipes, but I need to start playing around with trim sheets for other Griebling type elements in the environment. So I wanted to give a quick example of just how you could use a trim sheet in your workflow. So I've laid out a plane here that's got a texture on it. This texture is a bit more advanced in Unreal Engine. I didn't build it out super advanced in Blender. I just need the line markings on it to know where to work with. And I'm gonna cut out some of the squares on here and turn it into just a fun little object that I can throw into this back panel area. 
So I've got two squares back here and all I'm gonna do is extrude them up into a little box type shape, something simple. And you'll notice that the UVs on the edges are all stretched out there. So I'm gonna have to fix that. So I've got the side UV selected on here and I'm finding some little areas of this trim that look like they could line up with the box kind of nicely, kind of create a, a little bit of a metallic framing system around it. It doesn't all line up with the geometry perfectly, but I should be able to adjust this so it looks a bit better by just stretching out the UVs ever so slightly. Now I could export that as its own mesh, but I'm just gonna attach it into this wall panel mesh here and get it in game and see what it looks like. So you can see this material here has got this nice kind of metallic sheen to it. I've got the little edges of the box visible and this is essentially just a cube, an extremely cheap piece of geometry with a nice trim sheet material applied on top of it. And you can just kind of throw it into the background and it becomes a thing. And you know what, the edges on this are just a little bit too sharp for my liking. So I'm gonna go back in and just add a quick bevel modifier on here and it should be okay with the UVs. So there's bevel. Maybe that's a little too much. I'll go more subtle with the bevel. There we go. And there it is in game. A little bit of a bevel around there makes it look more like a um, some sort of insulation material on top there. And so here we are in engine and I've been making more updates to the station. We've kind of got this stripe pattern and new paint material around the entrance. And then inside I'm, I've got the trim material on some of the pipes in here which is uh, kind of getting reused, but I should be able to have one trim sheet for all the pipes in the game and give them different materials and stuff and then just change the colors and engine. Uh, here's this cutout area. I duplicated those things out a little bit and I added another little trim truss back there. Made these corner pieces based on uh, Island's concept art for it and I think they look cool. I like them. It's going to give us that ability to make the interiors a little less linear, break up the space a bit more. And so part of the idea here is to establish a really good tile system for this type of asteroid base. We'll have probably some more industrial looking ones and maybe medical ones. But then uh, a lot of the materials are going to be linked to some master materials where we can go in and start changing the colors or something. I got to do it a little different. I got to separate some of these things as decals and whatnot. So a little more thought has to go into it, but generally speaking, once I make the base material more white, we should have the ability to go in and start um, changing things to make the bases look and feel a bit more different without having to reinvent the wheel every single time. So as usual, we're working on about 50 different things at once, but having a lot of fun, really excited to get some of the SeaWiz stuff refined a bit more and get more of the base tiling system put away because we got a bunch of other cool assets in the pipeline coming down that I want to talk about in the next devlog. If you guys want to follow along more closely with our development process and also help us out on Discord, uh, check out our Discord in the video description. There's been a lot of devs on there that have been helping me build materials, helping us solve engine problems, troubleshoot things. Uh, you guys have been incredibly helpful to just progressing the project at a faster rate. So thank you all so much for dropping by Discord. If you guys enjoyed this devlog, don't forget to leave us a like, subscribe, hit that notification bell and all that cool stuff. And if you wanna know more about the concept of this game, check out this video right here. Uh, that'll explain more and you can see the full playlist as well. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. This is Level Cap signing off.